Hello, my name is Sherilyn Adcock. I'm the Executive Vice President in the Medical and Scientific Affairs Division of Worldwide Clinical Trials. My focus is supporting early phase clinical pharmacokinetic and bioanalytical services and transitioning compounds into phase two development. I've been in the clinical research industry for over 30 years and with Worldwide for 20 years. I'm a pharmacist by education and training with hospital community and consulting experience and hold a master's and PhD with emphasis in healthcare research and biostatistics. Today, I will discuss my observations related to phase one early development programs and highlight some of the significant changes we have experienced, particularly over the last decade. I want to provide a brief history related to clinical trials evolution in the United States. The Food and Drug Administration was established along with the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906, and it is the oldest federal agency that's dedicated to consumer protection in the U.S., and the agency's mandate to protect public health remains embedded in review of scientific evidence and subsequent regulatory actions. A uh, documented history of phase one trials in particular uh, is rather limited. The Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act of 1938 required research studies to be conducted to demonstrate safety and of a compound under conditions prescribed, recommended, or suggested in the proposed labeling. However, the act unfortunately did not provide any details or guidelines for specific conduct of these, these trials. Now, following the thalidomide disaster when thousands worldwide were harmed, there was widespread call for revision of drug laws. In 1962, the key fall for Harris amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act were enacted. This included regulations requiring proof of effectiveness, gave the FDA regulatory authority to investigate issues and regulate advertising of prescription drugs, as well as establish good, clinical, good manufacturing practices. In the early 1970s, a more organized approach began to evolve, outlining a process for formal investigation of new drug submissions to the agency. These submissions included data from well-controlled animal studies, as well as addressing quality control and consistency in product manufacturing. Now, phase one studies were expected to address and provide sound data to demonstrate the safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics in human volunteers. It was not until the early 1990s that the formal drug testing and approval process began to evolve. Preclinical testing became the prerequisite to human trials. Scientific methodology was expected to be followed and well-documented, and phases of clinical research were generally began to be defined as phase one, two, and three, and general descriptions of the requirements and oversight of these phases were established. The FDA today adopts the science of risk management. It emphasizes that quality risk management approach to design of studies by providing oversight, objective, and review of risk benefit analysis that serves as a guide to develop and for the development and the use of new drug products. It emphasizes the importance of organized data and appropriate labeling information in support of the new drug is intended clinical use, which in turn helps clinicians and patients make informed choices related to drug selection and treatment. It is the agency's expectation that quality risk management should include systematic processes designed to coordinate, facilitate, and improve science-based decision-making with respect to risk. Now, this FDA stance is outlined in the Guidance for Industry Q9 Risk Management Document. It's found in the guidance section of the FDA uh, website. In that document, factors involved with risk management are outlined and include risk assessment, risk control, risk communication, and risk review. Now, risk assessment includes risk identification or identifying the hazard. A risk analysis estimates the risk associated with that uh, identified hazard. And risk evaluation involves comparing the identified and analyzed risk. Risk control involves determining what can be done to reduce a risk and also what level of risk is acceptable. Risk communication is basically the next step, which involves sharing the information regarding risk assessment and risk control implementation to the development teams, partners, and the agency as deemed appropriate. And risk review is all an ongoing process 
and part of quality management and necessary to maintain continuous quality improvement. It is the agency's expectation that sponsors and CRO partners take into account all aspects of risk management during the drug development process through both formal and informal procedures and processes. Now let's look at the current trends in phase one clinical trials. A phase one program will include several studies to assist in fully characterizing the safety of a new compound. All of these studies are not necessary. All of these studies are not necessarily required prior to the evaluation in patients with a proposed indicated condition. As you can see from the slide, these studies may occur concurrently and not necessarily sequentially with the overall development program. Keep in mind that the data from each of these phase one studies can certainly add value to an investigational compound and may be important considerations should you plan to sell the asset or look for partnering for later phase development activities. Now, first in human trials obviously come first after preclinical investigations. However, there are a number of additional studies required depending on the characteristics of the compound and the expected or discovered safety profile. Not all of the studies listed above in the slide in the clinical pharmacology category may be needed. Having an initial pre-IND meeting and ongoing interaction with the agency can help identify which studies are required for your particular compound. Also of note, if you are planning to purchase an asset investigational compound, it is important to evaluate in detail what phase one clinical trials have been conducted and which ones still may be needed. Current agency review and recommendations may require additional phase one trial evaluation based on current regulatory guidances, which may not have been in effect when the first studies were done. Now, establishing this benefit to risk ratio supported by well-documented and well-conducted clinical trials is an important aspect for enabling care providers to make the decisions that are best for their patients. The above list is some of the phase one clinical trials routinely conducted by Worldwide Clinical Trials Clinical Pharmacology Unit. Traditionally, these studies, especially the first in human single ascending dose and multiple ascending dose studies, were conducted as separate discrete protocols, generally conducted consecutively, followed by other required trials depending on the compound's pharmacologic properties, pharmacokinetic characteristics, and safety profile. Over the past 10 years, variations have evolved due to the desire to collect more information in each protocol and the advancement of robust statistical methodology allowing for the management of large amounts of data collected. In addition, aggressive timelines may be expected even with these more complex designs. Today, single ascending dose and multiple ascending dose studies have been combined into one protocol assessing safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics and are often embedded with substudies for food effect, drug-drug interaction, and are cohorts of special or patient populations. The execution of these trials requires significant collaboration by the sponsor and the CRO to provide valuable scientific data coupled with logistical feasibility. Now within each one of these phase one trials there can be a number of special procedures which result in collection of an extraordinary amount of data. These can pose logistical challenges, but nothing that cannot be accomplished with upfront planning, including a well-defined communication plan, the right tools, and an experienced staff. It is essential to have the clinical pharmacology unit experts involved early in protocol development. The list in this slide is certainly not meant to be all-inclusive. Although the primary objectives in early phase clinical development are safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics for the most part, clearly including special assessments relevant to the intended indication can be insightful and bring value to the compound under development. For compounds with central nervous system indications, there are well over 40 validated instruments to consider. A CRO with an established reputation in clinical assessment technologies can be an invaluable resource in helping to choose the appropriate assessments to best fit your compound's expected profile. Imaging techniques may be available on site or at a nearby radiology and imaging center. It is very helpful to work with a clinical pharmacology unit that has well-established relationships with the imaging center, and that imaging center also has an interest and willingness to conduct clinical research. 
Whether your studies are in healthy volunteers or patients, a full suite of non-invasive cardiovascular assessments is needed to evaluate any cardiovascular issues for an investigational product. Clinical pharmacology units must be able to offer real-time evaluation of ECGs and telemetry, and also the ability to manage data capture for evaluation at a later date if deemed necessary. A clinical pharmacology unit working closely with a cardiac core lab can offer the expertise in the evaluation of cardiac effect, such as QT changes in particular, with precision and may allow for waiver for conducting a full TQT study at a later date. Most recently, the FDA has issued a draft guidance related to the assessment of presser effects of drugs. We will discuss this guidance in more detail later in this presentation. We have observed an increased utilization of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring systems in early phase development studies or phase two studies. Working with a vendor core lab that offers the APBM equipment solution as well as APBM data analysis and reports is the best approach for managing these aspects of the trial. Continuous and or intermittent cerebral spinal fluid collections are invasive procedures that cause limitations to the study participant's ability to be ambulatory for a period of time and pose a higher risk to the patient participant. Comparison of the pharmacokinetic data from the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid can provide valuable information about the drug's ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and to what extent it crosses. Clinical pharmacology units that perform this procedure have highly skilled medical staff and physicians, including anesthesiologists, performing these procedures and managing participant expectations and comfort needs. The CSF collections may also be used to evaluate disease-related biomarkers. Testing of drug compounds with respiratory indications or with respiratory-associated effects requires specialized pulmonary function testing equipment and highly trained staff. The studies may be performed in healthy volunteers or patient populations, but special emphasis must be placed not only on the testing procedures, but also on highly accurate, consistently administered dosing and sample collection procedures that to avoid air or surface contamination issues. Now we can all agree that clinical research studies have become increasingly complex, especially in the early drug development phase. This chart, although somewhat dated, compares the total number of procedures in phase one protocols over time and by therapeutic indication. It is rather surprising to see anti-infectives at the top of the list. However, having worked extensively in the investigational compounds with cardiovascular, central nervous system, and immunomodulator indications, I can certainly attest to the growing complexity of these trials over the past decade. Now, in reviewing some of the more recent first-in-human studies we have conducted at Worldwide Clinical Trials, we can corroborate the findings of the previous slide. As you can see, these single ascending and multiple ascending dose studies not only included atypical procedures such as fundoscopic exams, pharmacodynamic markers, and more, they also included cohorts of special patient populations. Here's an example of a timeline comparison between several phase one studies with a single compound which had both oral and IV formulations in development. The top graphic depicts the timeline with studies conducted in an overlapping sequence. We call this the expedited timeline or the need for speed. While the lower graphic shows the timeline for the same studies conducted consecutively one after another. In the expedited example, the safety committee reviewed data weekly, if not more often, evaluating both the oral and IV doses and also made dose adjustments as necessary. The on-site pharmacy services managed formulation of any dose adjustments needed. The original program was conducted in 2016 and 17. However, for the purpose of this presentation, I moved the dates to show the proposed program starting in June of this year. By working closely with the diagnostic lab on-site, the pharmacy services on site, and our local bioanalytical lab, we were able to compress the timeline significantly. In this particular example, we were able to save approximately 16 weeks in clinical conduct under the expedited model. So time savings can be considerable when SAD MAD studies are conducted concurrently and oftentimes in the same protocol, and the clinical conduct times can be shortened 
considerably. Safety team meetings can be conducted for the SAD and MAD studies at the same time if scheduled appropriately, and the PK, PK and PD samples can be analyzed on the same instrumentation and in a similar time frame. Reports can be written concurrently, all of this saving time. Now I would like to discuss FDA support for early development studies. The FDA has offered assistance in designing clinical studies in the form of guidance documents. A number of the Food and Drug Administration guidance documents are relevant to early phase studies. These guidance documents represent the FDA's current thinking on a topic. However, they do allow for different creative approaches within regulatory requirements. These are basically the FDA's interpretation of the regulations as it pertains to more specific drug development issues covered in the general 21 CFR regulatory documents. As of April 5th, 2020, there were 2,612 individual entries and over 60 subheadings to search in the guidance documents on the website. Clearly, all of these are not relevant to early development. However, many can, can provide valuable direction. One of the most recent FDA guidance documents that can impact early phase programs involves the evaluation of blood pressure through ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. This guidance was issued in 2018. Now, elevated blood pressure is known to increase the risk for stroke, heart attack, and death. Therefore, the effect of a drug on blood pressure is an important consideration in the benefit-risk assessment. The purpose of this guidance is to advise sponsors on the pre marketing assessment of the drug's effect on blood pressure. The guidance is intended to address precision and characterization of the drug and the effect of the drug on blood pressure during the drug development process. Epidemiological evidence shows that even a two to three millimeter of mercury increase in existing high blood pressure may significantly increase the rates of stroke, heart attack, and death. Although nearly every drug in development has some assessment of the effect of the drug on blood pressure, the methods for measuring the, with precision and evaluating blood pressure vary widely. Thus, small increases that may be relevant in overall assessment of risk may not be reliably detected by the typical methods. Now, there are two areas of concern voiced by the FDA in this guidance, identifying the presser effect, if any, in drugs under investigation. There are the small effects, where the agency indicates there's little concern for drugs indicated for short-term use that has, at most, small effects on blood pressure. The cardiovascular risks short-term and elevations of blood pressure is not thought to be significant. However, large effects, even over a short term, are of concern with uh, with drugs intended for sh these short-term use uh, indications. The recommendation uh, assessment of blood pressure using a cuff sphygmomanometry during routine study visits, measurement at baseline, at several interim visits, at trough measurements, and peak concentration if possible, and at the end of the study. Now, improving the accuracy of these measurements by including triplicate measurements of sitting blood pressure each measurement taken one minute apart, and measurement reporting uh, to the nearest even number in millimeters of mercury. Now, there is greater concern with the effect of drug on blood pressure when the drug is intended to be used chronically. Sustained, even small increases in blood pressure chronically increase risk of a cardiovascular event. The FDA recommends the use of APBM, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, as APBM is capable of detecting small but potentially relevant pre blood pressure effects. The advantage of APBM is that it assesses blood pressure over a 24-hour period of time, which provides a better understanding of the overall pressure effects than single time point evaluation. It also takes into account circadian rhythm and can be uh, evaluated during various levels of activity. Now, these devices can be somewhat inconvenient for the patients in, in the clinical trials wearing these, but they can certainly provide some valuable information. Now, we need to specify whether uh, 
systolic, diastolic, or mean blood pressure will be evaluated, and that's one thing that's addressed in these in this guidance. Measuring blood pressure throughout the day over a 24-hour period is important to measure overall effect. Uh, measurement at baseline and again at steady state is very important. And uh, study effects in individuals with characteristics that are similar to the intended patient population with respect to age, gender, and potentially even ethnicity are important considerations. Early small studies, although not useful in detecting subgroup effects, may still be useful in providing reassurance that there is no effect on allowing routine blood pressure measurements that would be sufficient in later phase studies and not require APBM monitoring. If the effect is observed, additional APBM and relevant subsets of patients should be a consideration. And the benefit to risk ratio must be considered, of course, uh, and that certain increases, um, minor increases in blood pressure may be acceptable or may be able to be managed in certain circumstances. So there are many questions to ask and to answer in early clinical development, and this requires a well-orchestrated plan. I would like to take this time to summarize some of the important considerations. A comprehensive investigator brochure that clearly tells the story of preclinical data is the basis for moving into early clinical designs and development. Healthy volunteer studies have been the mainstay in early development unless the drug clearly cannot be administered to healthy individuals, as is the case with cytotoxic compounds. Healthy volunteer studies help to inform on multiple indications. Recruitment is much easier and expeditious with healthy volunteers, and in general, PK, safety, and maximum tolerated dose in healthy volunteers translates well to patient populations and helps identify the starting dose levels in patients. This saves the patient population for later relevant early phase dose levels and for the phase two, three studies. The inclusion of a cohort or two of patient populations or special assessments in an early development program can certainly be valuable additions. Clearly, there is value in pushing the envelope within the constraints of safety, patient acceptance, and budget. The more data, the better. The clinical pharmacology unit, whether it's a standalone unit or in a hospital setting, is critical to managing all the moving parts of the early development studies. These units must be well-staffed and well-equipped for managing the logistics of multiple procedures in a short time span, ideally including on-site pharmacy formulation services, clinical diagnostic laboratory services, and full-time investigators and medical staff fully dedicated to clinical research. It is important that these assessments specific related to the indication or the disease state under evaluation be on site at the clinical pharmacology unit or in close proximity so as not to disrupt the flow of the procedures or unduly inconvenience the study participants. Now, there are four factors related to clinical trials in every phase of development. These are data. That means high quality data and lots of it. Time timely execution, which means no recruitment delays, how fast can you get me my data to make the next move or to meet the timelines imposed by investors, the flexibility to make changes and adjust timelines as needed, and the expedited back-end services such as PK, data management, biostatistics, and clinical study reports. Certainly cost is a factor. It's always been a factor but the best value does not always translate to the lowest cost. Integrated early clinical development services, we hear this often, especially with small and virtual companies. They need a one-stop shop with seamless execution and strong project management oversight over all the activities involved in a clinical research study. Clearly, all factors are important in the successful and meaningful research and the ranking of the importance of these factors really depends on the viewpoint of the stakeholder. Now, the execution of these phase one clinical trials requires significant collaboration and communication between the sponsor, the CRO, and any third party vendors that may be involved. Strong project management across all aspects of study activities, experienced medical and scientific oversight, and dedicated team members offer the best opportunity to meet the study objectives and deadlines. We at Worldwide Clinical Trials sincerely appreciate the opportunity to present to you today, and we are available to offer assistance with your clinical trial needs. 
Thank you. Thank you for listening to our webinar. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about how Worldwide can support your early phase trial, please contact us at worldwide.com.